Welcome to my channel, I'm Scott, and in this video I am going to walk you through the process of valuing Slumberjay stock by analyzing their financial statements and dissecting their financial ratios so we can determine if it's a buy or a sell. Slumberjay is an oil field services company. The company has four divisions. The first is digital and integration. The second is reservoir performance, then well construction, and last is production systems. It offers seismic surveys, which is the process to identify whether oil or gas deposits are beneath the Earth's surface. This is very helpful for exploration companies, so they do not have to waste their time and money digging beneath the surface if nothing is there. So this company has the equipment to look beneath rock or the ocean floor to identify how much and whether oil or gas is beneath there. The company also offers software for various functions within energy companies. It develops and deploys innovative technologies and services to evaluate, intervene, and stimulate reservoirs to help customers understand subsurface assets and maximize their value. It develops technologies and provides expertise that enhance production and recovery from subsurface reservoirs to the surface, into pipelines, and to refineries. It helps to optimize well placement and performance and maximize drilling efficiency. Well construction provides operators and drilling rig manufacturers with services and products related to designing and constructing a well. They also provide a comprehensive portfolio of equipment and services, including subsurface production systems, subsea and surface equipment, and midstream production systems. One of the big things that happened during the fracking boom was the ability to drill horizontally. For a long time, drilling only went straight down, which limited the amount of deposits you were able to tap into. By going down and then left or right, you can explore more of any given reservoir. This is a type of technology Slumberger can help companies with. You probably already see the immense value they provide. The great thing about this company is they do not assume any operational risk. That is all assumed by the oil and gas company that does the actual excavating. The company is headquartered in Houston, Texas and was founded in 1926. It trades on the New York Stock Exchange, Deutsche Bursa, Mexican Bolsa, Euronext Paris, Sao Paulo, Buenos Aires, and London Stock Exchange. Let's get started with the model. This is a large cap company, 46 billion market cap. They're trading at $33 a share and they have 1.4 billion shares outstanding. Let's look at the financials. The way you value a company is you estimate the free cash flows into the future and then you discount those numbers back to today's value. That's what we're doing in this video. And free cash flow is cash flow from operations minus capital expenditures. So you can see they have lots of free cash flow each year. It was highest in 2018 and 19. It dropped in 2020 due to lower oil prices, but it is coming back up in a trailing 12 months. Net income is the profit or loss on the income statement. It's revenue minus expenses. They had big negatives in 19 and 20 due to large write-offs. When you invest in a company with a lot of long-term assets, they tend to pass through a lot of write-offs. So that can really bring down the net income. So free cash flow is usually a better indicator of how the company's doing. Revenue is a sales for the company, and that was highest in 18 and 19, a lot lower in 2020 and the trailing 12 months due to lower commodity prices. This is the company's income statement. The top line is the revenue of the sales. Here's a breakdown of their 2020 revenue. 18 billion is international and five and a half billion is in North America. A benefit of investing in a company that sells products around the world is if one country is struggling, they can focus on other countries. For instance, if you were invested in a company that sold only in China and China was struggling economically while other countries was prospering, then that stock would really struggle. But if another company sold around the world, they can just focus on other countries if one country is struggling. Digital and integration is their smallest division at 3 billion. Reservoir performance is 5.6 billion. Well construction is their biggest 8.6 billion. And production systems is 6.7 billion. 
and they do more international business in each division than in North America. Below revenue is the cost of revenue. These are the expenses directly related to generating the revenue. Revenue minus cost of revenue gives you your gross profit, and that peaked in 2018, lowest in 2020. Below that is their operating expenses and then their operating income, which was lowest in 2020, but it is coming back in a trailing 12 months. They paid the lowest amount of interest on their debt in the trailing 12 months at 546 million. They had really large write-offs in 2019 and 20. That's why they had negative net income those years, positive in the other years. Here's a breakdown of their 2020 expenses, and you can see their income before taxes matches Yahoo Finance, negative 11.3 billion. So cost of revenue in Yahoo Finance is 21 billion. They broke that out into cost of services 14.7 billion and cost of sales 6.3 billion. So when they sell a physical product, that's cost of sales. But most of their sales are from services, 14.7 billion. 580 million was in research and engineering. General and administrative is pretty small at 365 million. This is payroll, rent, insurance, things like that. And they pass through over $12 billion of impairments. This is when you write down the value of an asset on your balance sheet and pass through the loss onto your income statement. This is an accounting loss. It doesn't affect cash flow. But even though it's an accounting loss, you don't like to see the value of the assets decrease. For instance, if your friend had a company and he said, we have $1 million of assets, we own a bunch of real estate, and the value of that real estate is a $1 million. Say his business was renting out properties and he asked you to invest $50,000 in the business. And say you did invest $50,000 and six months later, he said, I have to pass through an asset impairment. The value of the real estate is $500,000, not a million dollars. You might be upset. You might say to your friend, I put $50,000 into the business thinking there were a million dollars of assets. Now you're telling me there's $500,000 of assets. It's kind of deceiving. So you should look at their long-term assets over time. Here's a breakdown of their non-current assets. It went from 53 billion to 55 billion, down to 41 billion, down to 30 billion. So this is cause for concern. You may want to look into this a little deeper. If they're bringing in a sufficient amount of cash flow, then maybe it's okay and these were older assets they needed to dispose of. But if the decrease in the value of the assets results in lower cash flow, that could be a big problem. This is the company's statement of cash flows. The top line is operating cash flow. That's how much cash the company generates from its operational business. So you can see they generate lots of cash flow. The most in 18 and 19, when oil prices were higher, a lot lower in 2020, it is coming back in the trailing 12 months. And they invest a lot in property, plant, and equipment, capital expenditures. These investments in CapEx will increase their non-current assets. They spend between 1 billion and 2.3 billion a year in CapEx. Operating cash flow minus CapEx gives you your free cash flow. And they do have a good amount of free cash flow each year, so they do pay a dividend. They also buy back a little stock, 400 million in 2018, 278 million in 2019. When a company buys back stock, that decreases the shares outstanding, making your shares more valuable. In the past few years, they paid down more debt than they issued. Only in 2020, they issued more debt than they paid down, but the other years, they paid down more debt, a lot more in 2018 than they issued. Also, if you want to look into the investing cash flow section, you can get more information. CapEx is part of investing cash flow, but you can see in a trailing 12 months, they had negative 147 million in investing cash flow, negative 988 million in CapEx, so there were other things in this section. They generated $890 million from the sale of an investment. In 2020, they invested $1.4 billion. So that was a cash outflow of $1.4 billion, plus the $1.2 billion in CapEx. So that gave them negative $2.4 billion in investing cash flow. It looks like each year they're acquiring other businesses. $292 million they spent in 2018. They only spent 23 million in acquisitions in 2019, 33 million in 2020, 134 million in the trailing 12 months. But they sold businesses as well. They generated 109 million of cash from selling a business in the trailing 12 months. 
434 million in 2020, 586 million in 2019, and 579 million in 2018. They've been selling more of their businesses than they're acquiring. This is the equity section of their balance sheet. They have 13 billion of equity. They raised 12.6 billion from selling their business, and they profited 7.8 billion from running their business. They bought back 2.3 billion of stock. When a company buys back stock, they take it off the open market, put it onto their balance sheet in the equity section in treasury stock. This is a contra equity account, so it brings down your equity balance. They have negative 4.7 billion accumulated other comprehensive income. These are unrealized losses. And this negative 4.7 billion falls into these buckets. It could be currency adjustments, change in the fair value of hedges, stock-based compensation, or various other items. So this could indicate future losses on their income statement. When a company has a really large unrealized loss, that could give you some insight into the future. Because if you invest $1,000 into a stock, and now the value of that investment is $700, it's an unrealized loss of $300. You didn't lose anything until you sell the stock. Same thing if you have a stock that you paid $1,000 for and it's up to $1,300. You have a realized gain of $300. You didn't make any money until you sell the stock. So if you have millions and millions of dollars of unrealized losses, according to your tax return, you didn't lose anything. On paper, you did. Once you sell the stock, then you realize the loss. Same thing with these items. Once they sell or execute the contract, that's when they'll realize the loss. Let's look at the capital structure. 13 billion of equity, 15 billion of debt. They have 46% equity, 54% debt. Their net debt is 12 and a half billion and their WAC is 9.97%. And that's a discount rate we're gonna apply to the future cash flows. We estimated four years of future free cash flows. We also estimated the terminal value, which is all cash flows past year four, that's 46 billion. We discounted those numbers back to today using the weighted average cost of capital. We get a value of the company of $41 billion. We divide that by 1.4 billion shares. And we get a calculated stock price of $29. They're trading at $33, so they're trading at 13% premium. It's a sell according to the model. The average analyst projects their revenue to grow 10.8%. To calculate their future revenue, I grew a 10.8% a year for the next four years. To calculate their future free cash flows, I needed to see what percent of their revenue they convert to free cash flow. So I summed up these four free cash flow numbers. I divided by these four revenue numbers. And that comes out to 10%. So I multiplied their future revenue estimates by 10%. That's how I got their future free cash flows. And the numbers do seem reasonable, but I'm still coming out of the stock price lower than they're trading at. Simply Wall Street is higher than me. They're at $45 a share. They're saying the stock is 27% undervalued. Nine analysts priced this stock and the average price target was $39. The stock dropped a lot in March. That's during the coronavirus crash. Also, oil prices started to really drop a lot as well in 2020. But the stock is recovering. So the stock should move pretty closely with the price of oil. Since this company supports oil and gas companies, and those are the companies that pay them. In order for this company to make money and their stock price to go up, the companies they support need to make money. They used to pay a 50 cent dividend, they cut it to conserve cash. Now they pay a 13 cent dividend, that's a 1.5% dividend yield, which they can definitely afford, that's 42% of their net income, 27% of their free cash flow. Their employee count has gone down. It was 120,000 in 2015. Now it's down to 86,000. This is a really volatile stock. It has a beta of 2.3, so the stock moves more than two times the market. It's gone up 118% in the past 52 weeks, while the S&P is up 33%. The 52-week low was 15, the high was 37, and the stock is trading above its 50-day and 200-day moving average. And this is a really popular stock. 11 million shares are traded each day. All the shares outstanding are on float. 79% are held by institutions and only 2% of the shares are shorted. In the past year, no insiders have bought the stock, but there's a lot of selling. That's not a good sign if you own this stock. The biggest shareholder is Vanguard, then BlackRock, State Street, Dodge and & Cox, and a French asset manager, Mundy. Let's look at their financial ratios. 
Their PE is a little high at 28. It is better than a market average, but worse than a market median. PE is stock price over earnings per share. So investors are paying $28 for $1 of earnings. Price to sales is pretty good at 2.1 and price to book is also pretty good at 3.5. Price to book is stock price over book value per share. The way you calculate book value per share, it's equity over shares outstanding. Equity is on the balance sheet, it's assets minus liabilities. And they have 13 billion of equity, negative 3 billion of tangible equity, since they have over 16 billion of intangible assets on their balance sheet. Earlier, we were talking about the company's decreasing long-term assets. And we were saying they're passing through lots of impairments. Well, it seems like they may be passing through lots of goodwill impairments, which are kind of meaningless. If they were passing through impairments on physical assets like buildings and machinery, that could be an issue. But goodwill impairments are just a plug. It's an accounting plug. The way goodwill comes about is when you acquire a company for more than it's worth. In order to get your balance sheet to balance, you plug in goodwill. And that's a long-term asset that doesn't get depreciated or amortized. It gets tested annually for an impairment. Their return on invested capital is 7.7%. I like to see at least 10%. If it's not 10% above its WAC, and their WAC is 10%. So that is on the lower side. Their interest coverage ratio is 4.5, so they can cover their interest payments four and a half times. Their ROE is 12.4%, which is really good. A company can inflate its ROE if it has a lot of debt. They have a current ratio above one, but a quick ratio below one. They have 2.9 billion of cash on their balance sheet, 5.3 billion of receivables, and 3.3 billion of inventory. They seem to be well capitalized. They had 2.6 billion of free cash flow in the trailing 12 months, 2.7 billion of working capital. Working capital is current assets minus current liabilities, and they pay out $700 million of dividend payments, so they have $4.6 billion of funding. The best way to look at ratios to compare them to companies in the same industry. I've done videos of seven companies in the same industry as Schlumberger. And if Schlumberger has a number in red, they're worse than the average. If they have a number in blue, they're better than the average. So they're better in PE. Two of these companies have negative earnings, so we can't look at the PE. Halliburton is really high. Payson is through the roof. Their price of sales is worse than the average. Same thing with the price to book and current ratio. Their ROE is 12%, the average is negative. They're higher in debt than the average company and they're the biggest company on this list by far. And they pay a dividend of 1.5%, which is higher than average. Some of these companies don't pay a dividend at all. To summarize, I have them trading at a 13% premium. This company has been around a really long time. They're a really respected company. They provide quality products and services. Energy is so important. And I know energy is changing the way we're getting it. And Schlumberger provides a lot of the tools and services that are really expensive and complex for companies to figure out on their own. So they're a really helpful source. With that said, I think it's a good long-term stock, but the short term may be a bit bumpy. I rank their free cash flow 7 out of 10, their revenue 6 out of 10, and their ratio is 5 out of 10. So let me know what you think. Give this video a like, subscribe, or comment below. Also, if you like to get a custom valuation or just support the channel, you can become a member by clicking on the link in the description below. Thanks for watching.